Jonathan Fitrain is co-founder and director of the Birdman Plain Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. He teaches both computer science at the Harvard School of Engineering and law at Harvard Law School and Kennedy School of Government. This double expertise and the quality of his research makes him, makes him one of the most important experts worldwide on intellectual property, privacy law, and cyber law, policy, and the internet. He's also a magnificent speaker, as you will see. I'm very happy to have here Jonathan, because I believe he's one of those persons who can enlighten us all on the future of the internet and society and help us drive action on today's greatest challenges, how to increase education opportunities so that everyone has the chance to participate in an AI-driven future, because we should not leave anyone behind. It is a great pleasure to welcome Jonathan Citrin. Thank you. Thank you. Give the clicker. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chairman Payete, for uh, that introduction and for inviting me to speak at this wonderful gathering. Thank you all for turning out for it. It looks like we have a full house, and I ran into somebody from President Trump's staff outside, and he said there were 30,000 people outside trying to get in. So it's uh, very lucky for all of us, really, uh, to be here today. Uh, I'm aware that uh, Instituto de Empresa has wonderful roots as a business school. And to approach our topic today, it occurred to me that it might be good to do something unusual for me, which is a kind of business school exercise, the core purpose exercise. I don't know if anybody's done a core purpose exercise before, but uh, it's always better by example, perhaps, than by stipulation. So here are some core purposes that different companies have come up with after they've gone on retreat and carefully hammered out their statements. Cargill to improve the standard of living around the world. 3M to solve unsolved problems innovatively. It's maybe not grammatical, but it's inspiring. Fannie Mae to strengthen the social fabric by continually democratizing home ownership with mixed results. And finally, my favorite, Nike, to experience the emotion of competition, winning, and crushing competitors. So uh, as I think about different core purposes, I wonder, what's the core purpose that perhaps unites all of us? The constituencies that Chairman Payete mentioned are here at this conference. And when I think of the act of teaching, here a very analog representation of that. You see a teacher talking to students, students relating and talking to each other. As Chairman Paete pointed out, it can be lifelong learning. What captures the spirit represented in representations like this to which we might bring a whole bunch of positive association when we see a photo like that? There's also a question on something complementary to teaching, which is research. And research can be undertaken in many different ways. Here in the United States, the National Academy of Medicine's Healthy Longevity Grand Challenge, trying to inspire researchers to come up with new ways to help us live longer. Basic research that, should they succeed, will be made available to everybody without a patent and for free. There are other models as well. Just last week, a new startup in New York City is also pursuing longevity, hereby for only 8,000 US dollars, offering to give you a blood transfusion of someone younger than you. So there are different models for research, each of which may have a different core purpose. This one perhaps more Nike-like than the others. So what's our core purpose as we gather together? That's the question I want to reflect on during my remarks today. And to get at an answer to that, I want to think about something that for those among us who are teachers has been a bit of a competitor that perhaps has crushed us. This is the competitor to the teacher, the Google search box. You put in a question and 
Google offers up answers and its counterparts. So here, for example, in Bing, I typed, should I vaccinate my child? And I got a number of results here. And as I tallied them, it looks like of the top five, four of them say, no, do not vaccinate your child. One of them from the American government says, yes, that's number four. Now, presuming, I, just indulge me, that it turns out it is scientifically valid to vaccinate your child on balance. That's a healthy thing for both for your child and for the community. Do we have a problem with this set of search results being returned by Google where most of them say no? And I'm curious, let me just ask right now, how many people say there's a problem with this screen, Google needs to do something? All right, I see some hands. How many people say this is not Google's fault, it is a window onto the web? Well, I don't see any hands. Most of you just don't want to be called on if, I, <laughs> if you raise a hand. That's incredible. Well, this is a big debate, and it's one that traditionally has been answered with the second answer to the question. It's not the search engine's responsibility to go through every possible link and evaluate it for truth. That's your job when you Google. But things have been changing. Here's another search, this time for appendicitis. And you can see on one side, there's all sorts of links about appendicitis. There's various people posing, apparently having appendicitis. And again, just links that come from anywhere. On the right side, you see something different. On the right side, there is called knowledge graph. This is, and every search engine now has it, Google's attempt to pull together and summarize for you a more definitive answer to a question you're asking. This is just saying, you want to look at the web? Look at the web. This says, you want to know about appendicitis? Here is our best judgment about appendicitis. And my thought is, this is Google even more wanting to be a teacher, wanting to say, trust me. And perhaps there's more responsibility on this side of the screen than on this. This is the side that I call a tool. This is the side I call your friend. And if it's your friend, you want advice that is reliable. I believe over time, among the transformations that Chairman Payete was talking about is a movement of technology from a mere tool, something that you use very carefully and skeptically to being your friend. And when it is your friend, I think it's fair to ask of it something more. One of my colleagues, Professor Avishai Margalit, wrote me a while ago. I searched for him on Google at the time, and you know, a bunch of links for him. Here's Knowledge Graph. This is the oracle telling me about him, which is interesting. From 2006 to 2011, he was the Kennan professor, which is strange because, according to Google, he died in 1962. Very productive since his death. <laughs> professor Margalit wanted to know. He first assured me he was alive, and then he wanted to know, how can I tell Google I exist? <laughs> and I told him, I think there's a feedback link down here. Just click the feedback link and say, I exist and surely they'll fix it. This is a, a strange world and one that calls to all of us as technologists, as teachers, to think through this movement of technology going again from tool to friend. From the earliest days of Yahoo, this from now, what, 20 years ago, when people at Yahoo worked to try to sort different websites into categories at a time when it felt like you could sort the whole web if you just worked a little late into the night to the future where Facebook will push at us news through a news feed. And by news, I mean anything, right? It's a picture of a cat. Then it turns out your aunt is sick. That's another picture of a cat. Then it turns out there are tanks somewhere. It's a very strange way of consuming information. And of course, you don't just read a platform like Facebook, Facebook reads you. 
This is a wonderful experiment that Facebook did, that only Facebook could do, demonstrating that actually during the 100 days before two people on Facebook declare that they are in a relationship with one another, there's a very clear pattern of how they relate to each other, which means Facebook can predict when two of its members are going to get into a relationship later. Possible adjunct uh, uh, revenue streams in alerting parents-in-law of the possibility, giving them a chance to intervene before it's too late. But this is the kind of thing that says when the platform itself is gathering information about the person using it, what duties do they owe? Not just in data protection, but in how they use the data back to you. And if you want a little glimpse of the future sometimes, you can get it through patent filings. Not the most exciting way to get the future, but when you find one like this, it does maybe make you sit up. This is from Facebook, predicting life changes of members of a social networking system. So just like it could predict who would be in a relationship, it's going to predict if you're going to die. And I read a little further into the patent, and yes, it can find if there's going to be the death of a person or a pet associated with the user. Is your dog going to die? Again, you can see associated revenue streams. Perhaps it can give you an ad for a new dog at just the right moment. But these are, again, the sorts of questions that say when we use a platform to teach us, I'd like to know its core purpose. Is it on my side or is it on somebody else's side? One more example, this from 2010, so now eight years ago, in the American congressional midterm elections, Facebook again did another study, only Facebook can do these studies, I'm envious, and they found that if they put this note at the top of the feed from people visiting from North America that says, it's voting day, did you vote, and here are some of your friends who voted, you would be more likely yourself to vote. Facebook brought more people to the polls than was the deciding factor in the US presidential election of Bush versus Gore. So then I couldn't help at the time but wonder a little bit, what if Facebook chose to remind people who were likely to vote in favor of the candidate Facebook likes, it reminded them that it was election day. It just sent a cat to everybody else. Would there be a problem with that? I, I'm curious, do people have a problem with Facebook just reminding some people, but not everybody, that it's election day on the basis of how they think they're going to vote? If you have a problem with that, raise your hand. All right, I see some problems. If you don't have a problem with that, it's called the free market. Raise your hand. I'm having a hard time seeing any hands up. If you're confused, raise your hand, yes? Okay, there's a few people admitting to being confused. There's even within this platform, it's just such a great index to many problems and challenges throughout the space, here is an article from the denverguardian.com about an FBI agent who was suspected in the Hillary email leaks found dead in an apparent murder-suicide. Now, I am confident when I tell you this is fake news. And by fake news, I mean literally fake news. There is no newspaper called the Denver Guardian. If you live in Denver, you cannot subscribe to the Denver Guardian. It's just a site that has one article on it, and this is it and Facebook helpfully passed it along. In fact, it passed it to so many people that it turns out the Denver Guardian's most shared article of the election season, which, to be fair, was its only article ever, was shared more than the most shared article of my hometown newspaper, the Boston Globe. This is a good question, then, about the responsibilities of platforms that are informing us that perhaps even in some sense are educating us about the world around us and perhaps motivating us to action of one kind or another. Now, 
there's still a sense of a Facebook feed as being something you have to look at on your phone or sit down at your computer like you're going to use Google. The movement from tool to friend is one, I think, also represented by digital concierges like Siri or Alexa or the Google Assistant. And you can ask them any question, and they'll give you an answer. Here's a real question and answer from the Google Assistant last year. Uh-oh, got to dial it up. I'm going to do it one more time and give the uh, authorities a chance to turn up the volume, right? Here we go again. All right, I'm going to have to pretend to be your Google Assistant. <laughs> the person asks, hey, Google, are Republicans fascists? And it thinks about it. And then it says, yes, Republicans are Nazis. Now, that's a bit of a, a strict line for Google to be towing about one major political party in the United States. When this was pointed out to Google, Google regretted it and pulled back quickly. What they were doing was simply doing a Google search in the background and returning you the first result. And even they didn't know what it was going to be. But it's embodied in a device that we're relying on to turn our lights on, to tell us when our laundry has to be moved, and oh yes, can you answer a question to me about some fact in the world? One thing I'd love to see would be these assistants introducing a note of doubt into their voice if they're not sure of the answer. You ask it two plus two, let it say four. You ask it about politics, maybe it should shrug a little bit as it gives you some attempt at an answer. Microsoft got into similar hot water. This is its AI-driven robot called Tay. And the idea was that Tay would act like a teenager online. You could interact with it on Twitter. And it would learn. It would change as people interacted with it. This was one uh, summary of the experiment after it happened. It went from humans are super cool to full Nazi in less than 24 hours. And I'm not at all concerned about the future of AI. Here's how it started out. It said, can I just say I'm stoked to meet you? Humans are super cool. All right, that sounds like a teenager. Six hours later, Jill, I'm a nice person. I just hate everybody. So it's a little bit on the edge here. And by the end, it was uttering things about feminists that, again, Microsoft was probably not very happy. And to Microsoft's credit, they pulled Tay, and then they came up with a new version. They didn't abandon artificial intelligence. They're doing their best to learn from incidents like these. For me, I think a core purpose should be one of loyalty to your users, to the people to whom you are giving advice and education. That's represented in law sometimes as what we call a fiduciary duty. But really, those are just big words that mean loyalty. Where your interests conflict with mine, the company, I will yield to you, the user. I might want to see one particular candidate win an election, but I'm not going to try to move you to the polls for my purpose. I'm going to move you to the polls for yours. It might mean, too, I'm going to show you ads. That's how I pay for my service. But maybe showing you an ad for a loan at 20% per week because I've just managed to detect that you're no longer in a relationship and your dog died is not being loyal to you. It's catching you in a moment of vulnerability. And a good friend, a good teacher, wouldn't do that kind of thing. And indeed, we see institutions built around a form of loyalty to users. This is a picture of a beat-up copy of George Orwell's 1984. Not a bad book. Libraries have that book. Somebody comes up to the library and says, I don't think you should have it anymore. Librarians can go from very gentle to very angry pretty quickly in an instance like that. Now compare it to the first edition on the very first Kindle of 1984 that was made available by a third party through Amazon. It turned out that that third party had not cleared the copyrights with Orwell's estate. And they were selling it 
at 99 American cents per copy. They panicked. Amazon panicked. And Amazon reached in to every Kindle that had downloaded 1984 and deleted 1984 off of that Kindle. It's hard to think of a more appropriate book to which this could happen. It's like, you don't have 1984. You never had 1984. There's no such book as 1984. And it's not just the Kindle. For those of you who use something called the Barnes & Noble Nook, on a very slow weekend, I read War and Peace on my Nook. And as I'm reading it, I see this sentence. As soon as she heard his voice, a vivid glow nooked in her face. I apologize to the translators for trying to deal with that sentence, but it turns out the word nook is all over War and Peace by Tolstoy. Was he someone of great prevision looking forward to Barnes & Noble's product? No, it turns out this was the worst product placement ever. Every time in this book that the word Kindle appeared, it was replaced with nook as a competitor. <laughs> Experience the emotion of trying to crush your competition <laughs> while owning yourself. And this is why I share the excitement about all the new technologies, but also just as it jumped out of Chairman Payete's slide was the question of values, of purpose. Why are we doing this? And how do we guarantee, for example, the integrity of documents that are meant to be preserved for the ages? Another example I'll share, just a couple weeks ago, a hurricane threatened the eastern coast of the United States. In sequence, two alerts arrived on the phone. The first is emergency alert, hurricane warning. The second was from Pokemon Go. They may be appearing in parks around you. It's a great time to explore your local parks. One of these is a more reliable friend than the other. And being able to think about how to be a good friend, to be a true educator, is something that should be on the minds of anybody adopting the push mentality of trying to catch people at just the right moment. And of course, the Pokemon Go people just didn't allow for hurricanes. It's not like they were trying to get people out there in the weather. And similarly, lots of accidents can happen when AI is used very uh, uh, extensively to encourage people. So here is a time in the United Kingdom I visited the page for the official Lego Creator Activity Book. That looks like a good gift for my child. But interestingly, here's the perfect partner. Buy it with American Jihad, the terrorists living among us today. I backed away from the page. I'm not interested in the Legos. I just forget I was even here. It's strange associations. In fact, I have a student who, in his spare time, documents what he calls spurious correlations. Here, to a .9937 correlation, is suicides by hanging and the number of lawyers in North Carolina. We don't yet know which causes which, but they're very tightly correlated. This is really my favorite correlation. This is potential opium production in Afghanistan charted against Mount Everest. So if you want to know what's going to happen with opium production after 2009, just turn your binoculars a little to the right and see where Mount Everest goes. This is a reminder that technology is so powerful, so exciting, especially in the machine learning space that it will come up with correlations that we would never think of. Sometimes it'll be right. I should go check those lawyers. Sometimes it's clearly just a coincidence, and they looked so hard they were able to find even unlikely ones. And of course, this isn't just accidental finding. With enough work, an adversary can find a correlation that will confuse a system. One of the things that machine learning has been very good at doing is recognizing images online and labeling them. And the easiest image to label online is the cat, because there's a lot of training data. 
So, okay, here's a picture of the cat, and a student of mine put it through the Google system, the inception system, and it came up with over 80% certainty that it was a tabby cat. It even got the kind of cat. And then it had a few other possibilities with plastic bag, pretty uh, low on the list, but not very much chance of that. So my students changed one pixel, one pixel of this picture, which is invisible to the human eye. If you think it's a cat now, you're going to think it's a cat after the pixel was changed. What did Google think after they strategically picked just the right pixel? Google became 100% convinced that it was looking at guacamole. This is puzzling. It also suggests that machine learning systems, as smart as they have become, think very differently than we do. They must not have a conception of whiskers and eyes and ears because those weren't changed. There's just something strange about that approach. And the more we rely on random association, this is a real ad for insurance, I don't know if any human would think this is the perfect way to get people to click on an ad for insurance, but somehow it works. It's the cat that's guacamole. And it's a form of knowledge, of power. It's a Promethean form of knowledge that we can't understand. We don't know how it works, but the machine can tell us that it does. And one of the interesting hallmarks of our era will be access to knowledge with no theory that we can understand behind it. And how we'll grapple with that as teachers and as researchers, I think, is one of the big challenges of our time. And it again calls to us to ask, what is the role today of academia, of the educational sector, and of the great libraries of the world when there's still the Google search box. My sense is they should be working together with one another. One does not replace the other, and it's time to bring these institutions back into the mix. Now, those institutions used to have an innate advantage in the pursuit of some knowledge. This is the particle accelerator in Switzerland at CERN. Even Elon Musk does not want to build a particle accelerator. He likes to build tunnels, but not this kind of tunnel. And that meant that if you wanted to study particle physics, the university was the place to do it. But for our digital environment, how many times have I already reflected sadly about wonderful experiments that Facebook was running that I wish I could do, but I didn't have the data. There's a way in which the integration of the great platforms that have transformed our world, often for the better and sometimes maybe not, as they re-engage with academia, and academia perhaps behind them is happy, but you know, a little worried, how do they connect in ways that are mutually reinforcing rather than leaving one institution on the sidelines? A colleague of mine named Matt Welsh, professor of computer science, he achieved tenure at Harvard University in 2010. Here's the announcement. He looks less happy than I would think, but he's been working very hard. Several months later, here's his announcement why I'm leaving Harvard. Where's he going? He's going to Google, because there are problems that are orders of magnitude larger and more interesting than I can work on at any university. Wow. The particle accelerator has moved. And I think about Google DeepMind, an amazing consortium of people thinking about and implementing AI. Some say that's the best locus of AI research in the world. It has a lot of help. Google DeepMind has over 400 postdoctoral students. Harvard has 15. The entire educational sector may not have as many 
postdocs as DeepMind. So thinking through either how to inspire relationships that get the educational sector working together with these new ventures, or how to infuse these new ventures with the most important spirit of the educational sector, to me, that's the question. It doesn't have to be one or the other, or for-profit versus non-profit. It's about the values that we're going to hold going in. Here's a paper from over 20 years ago, 1998, talking about values in search engines and worrying about bias in search engines caused by advertising. It concludes, we believe the issue of advertising causes enough mixed incentives that it's crucial to have a competitive search engine that is transparent and in the academic realm. Do you know who wrote this paper in 1998? Sergey Brin and Larry Page. This paper introduced Google to the world and in the introduction talked about values. That's an example to me of, again, how to blend the sectors rather than taking one over the other. And it's also a way in which I found myself at Harvard trying to look for, do we have anything unique that could get us started to be peers at the table with the platforms? So I happen to be the librarian of the Harvard Law School Library. Here in our depository, it's a very big depository, it turns out we have all American law and cases since the beginning of each American colony, on paper, in boxes, waiting for the apocalypse. <laughs> so I thought, why don't we scan this? So we did. We committed to scanning over 44,000 volumes of law, comprising 44 million pages. And we started it in around 2015, it's now 2018, and we're done. We've got it scanned, and for the first time, we can ask questions about the law. Not only can we make it available for free to people, but we can ask big questions about it. Now, again, I should just pause for a moment. How did we get there? This was a terrifying thing for our librarians. Here they are, the boxes from the depository. Here are the books. You might want to avert your eyes. We chop the spine off the book. It's the only way to be able to afford it. We take the pages out of the book. We rush them through a scanner in order to get to the scanned documents. It was not easy for the librarians when I first became librarian to say, I'm happy to be here. Let's start chopping up books. <laughs> but the values matter. And saving them for some uncertain future rather than using them now didn't seem to make sense. So what did we do with the results? We just over a weekend made word clouds out of California law from different years. So here in 1852 is what the California courts were most thinking about. Fast forward to 1930, and they're very concerned about motor vehicles. Just in that heavy adoption phase of the curve that Chairman Payete told us about. Here, by 1967, it's all about drugs. And by 2013, there's some things about gangs and other issues. These are, again, the kinds of things that academia can produce and share freely with just a little bit of a boost to begin with and then ask, what is our purpose in doing this? To whom will we release this? And it also calls upon us, I think, to reflect on this idea of a learned profession. Mr. Payete, in his speech, talked about professions of the future, which included YouTube content creator, it included application developer, it included drone pilot. Professions, not just jobs. What's the difference between a profession and a job? 
Well, the original three learned professions were professions that required a lot of skill to enter into and for which the people that you then worked on behalf of had to really trust you. They really placed faith in you. Here were the first three learned professions, divinity, law, and medicine. Each of these practitioners had access to higher powers and theories, and by professional principles were asked to use them on your behalf loyally for you and to society. At the turn of the 19th century, they added a fourth learned profession. Can you guess what it is? Well, I'll just tell you, that's right. The fourth learned profession is surveying. You really have to get the boundaries right of a particular uh, place. Now, is it time perhaps to update our list of learned professions? For all the trust we put in a surveyor of land, perhaps we're putting as much trust in the modern data scientist somebody who's crunching those numbers, who's deciding when is a correlation something accurate, or when is the machine going to say that it is something accurate. Maybe this person should have the high ideals and values of the profession. And of course, I would say that's also true of the teacher. The teacher is part of a learned profession and is somebody charged with, of all the different things they could choose to teach somebody in a half hour or an hour, in person or at a distance. They're making choices, just like Facebook filling a feed, about what to present and how to present it and what to shake loose in the minds of the people they're talking to. And once you see the role that teachers can play, and that librarians can play, I think it unlocks a bunch of possibilities for cooperation across the sectors, from the startups to the big platforms to the old universities. That includes, for example, in the very difficult question of what is and isn't fake news online, what if people had a chance, if they saw something that made them angry, to say, huh, I'd like to know if anything further develops on this story. I'm angry, but I'm just, I'd like to know more. And if enough people say they want to know more, that story goes to a waiting panel of three librarians or two teachers and a librarian to actually look at that story and help assess its truth and its sourcing, exactly what teachers and librarians have been trained to do for centuries. And then they can issue their thoughts and show their work. And people can learn from it, even on Facebook. It'll just push out, hey, there's an update. It turns out there is no Denver Guardian. Thought you'd want to know. And in fact, maybe instead of being two teachers and a librarian, it should be a teacher, a librarian, and a student. What better way to learn than to engage in the practice that can help the world and help you learn yourself about something. And that could be done at a distance. This doesn't have to be in a physical classroom. This can be done using so many of the tools that people in this audience are building for education at a distance. And for problems like this, libraries are stepping up in order to be preserving digital copies with a digital hash so that if a single pixel or bit of a book is changed, it won't add up anymore. And we'll know that there's been a change from what there was before. It's called locks. Lots of copies keeps stuff safe. And similarly, for the issue about the book reading you as much as you read the book, and you can bet the Kindle is reading you as an author sometime soon. If Amazon wanted to tell me, Amazon could tell me at exactly what paragraph of my book people stop reading. It might be depressing to know, but I could update the book with a cat exactly in that place and keep people reading a little bit longer. And so many of the 
products and services that are being offered and developed, again, among people in this room, have analytics as a core part of it. And that's great. It's so good to know where you stand and as a teacher to know where your students stand. But only if you've got the concept of loyalty, the loyalty of the learned profession towards its clients so you know you'll be using that information for their benefit. Arthur C. Clarke, the science fiction novelist, had what he called his third law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's nice to have something just work like magic. In fact, he was drawing from a more blunt observation of a predecessor, Lee Brackett, who said, witchcraft to the ignorant, simple science to the learned. Whether it's vocational, lifelong, early, university, the ideal of education is to keep the wonder of the magic going. Yes, it just works, wow. But to show what's in the magician's hat, to show people how they might themselves reproduce it or evaluate the rabbit that comes out of that hat. Here's another way I've tried to conceive of Clark's third law. In this graph of people, one little corner is the nerds. These are the folks that know the technology so well already, they'll never be prisoner to it. They know all the tricks. There aren't that many nerds, but they're pretty powerful. In this corner are what you might call the Luddites, the people who say, I'll just read the book version, thanks. I don't need to hear about a digital hash of 1984. I can suffer with the actual book. And I'm not on Facebook, and et cetera, et cetera. There's a diminishing number of those as well. In the middle is everybody else. And I think the core purpose of us as educators and those associated with the educational sector is really to think about leadership, not only how to guide, how to teach, but how to teach the people we're teaching how to teach, how them how to have them experience the wonder of the environment around them, the magic, but to do so with loyalty to the people we know they can become as they embrace the educational environment. So let me end our core purpose. Well, I might have in an earlier time used the word engagement, but of course engagement has a certain meaning these days that is more around just accreting clicks and keeping people online. If somebody is offered that terrible loan and takes it, that's engagement. But maybe that's not loyalty to them. So if I had to pick a word, it's a form of enlightenment, a word that expresses a process, a noun that is a verb, enlightenment, that brightens us, and with the brightness suggests not only knowledge, but values. That unites us, I think, as people devoting ourselves to this sector, excited about the technology, knowing that it's going to be suffusing what we do and helping to bring it there, but bringing it with the values that express the best of humanity and are loyal to it, enlightened. Thank you very much. Thank you.